How you doing, folks? This is Rex from the Buckeye Nest coming to you with a, another episode of From a Veteran's Point of View. This is episode five. Got a few things I'm going to talk about during it, but as usual, I want to start out with some of the neat new news at the Dayton VA. Most of you know by now I support several nonprofit organizations out there with the Buckeye Nest. Miami, uh, I'm sorry, the American Veterans Heritage Center, their nonprofit. Dayton, the Honor Squad at the Dayton Cemetery. And of course, the VA themselves, they have different things going on out there, even though they're not a nonprofit. And another organization I, I help support is the Miami Valley Military History Museum. They're kind of part of the AVHC. So given all that, I got a whole lot of new announcements. Excuse me, I got an itchy ear here some, for some reason today. I got a whole lot of announcements I want to talk about going out at the Dayton VA and for with those different nonprofits this year. So let's get started. First, let's talk about the Dayton VA. Got a major, major, major announcement from them via email today the community relations people and can you see that without all the glare there we go Dayton VA Medical Center in the news the National Archives is moving to the Dayton VA Medical Center now I'm going to try to read a little bit of this to you real quick <clears throat> Outgoing National VA Secretary Robert McDonald officially designated the Dayton VA as a National Archive in one of his final acts prior to leaving office Friday, the VA said. A Trump administration nominee, David Shulkin, the current VA Undersecretary of Health, is expected to take over the top post. In April, McDonald declared the VA campus in Dayton the site for the future archive estimated to cost $20 million through a mixture of public dollars and yet to be raised private funds. McDonald said then Dayton was a fitting home for the agency's historical archives. Pretty awesome announcement to make, especially this year, because the Dayton VA Medical Center is celebrating their 150th anniversary. And I'll, let me read on here. A memorandum of, of agreement on the project was signed Thursday between federal VA leaders and local government nonprofit agency and economic development officials. Really, we wanted to make sure we had something in writing, some kind of a stake in the ground that would say we're definitely doing this, Dayton VA Met Director Glenn Costi said in an interview Thursday. The VA, has, the VA has committed roughly $5 million to $6 million so far, Costi said, and future fundraising will need to pay the rest in what could take 5 to 10 years to complete. The new agreement set up a governing board and a committee to raise money. Two buildings will be part of the project. The agency's massive archives will be housed in an old national headquarters and a clubhouse. As part of the first phase, Costi will remove renovation work, replacing the roof and windows, etc., 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 because there's still two more pages of this announcement. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a uh, special events section up on the Buckeye Nest and put a link right up on the home page to it. And I will put this announcement in there so you can read further about the uh, announcement itself. So when you get up on the Buckeye Nest, take a look for this page right here. News, news, news about the Dayton VA and the National Archives coming there. I got a whole lot to talk about, so let me move on. I, I did neglect to mention one of the nonprofits that I support at the, at the uh, uh, well, they were at the Dayton VA, no longer, is the For Free Equestrian Team. Now, the For Free and Equestrian Team was a pretty awesome organization, and uh, the volunteers uh, started dwindling uh, pretty fast, and that was part of the uh, cause of the loss of the program at the Dayton VA. Sad to see it go. But there is good news. 
they have a new home for their monthly meetings. They're meeting here in the uh, American Legion uh, Post 707 in Inglewood, Ohio. They're going to do that on the fourth Thursday of every month, and the meeting starts at 6 p.m. Last night, we had our first meeting for the year, and we have an event schedule. So, let me read it off here to you. Keep in mind now, the Four Freedom Equestrian Team is a nonprofit organization, and you can see all kinds of video uh, about the different things they did at the VA up there and, and things that they did off-site at the VA. Uh, I still have it published on the Buckeye Nest, uh, and you can go to their uh, main domain. There's a link on the, their website at the Buckeye Nest. So just look in the nonprofit section and click on Fourth Freedom Equestrian Team on the home page on the Buckeye Nest. But this year we got some pretty pretty awesome events coming up. They're going to uh, help with the flag refresh ceremony. They do the honor squad at the uh, Patriot Freedom Festival in, in the Dayton VA on May 27th and 28th of this year. So they'll be out there uh, doing the uh, Blue Star Mothers flag refresh, which is on May 28th. Then they're going to do a golf classic, uh, uh, honor squad, uh, color guard ceremony for the, the Blue Star Mothers golf classic in Beaver Creek. And finally, they are doing an, an event on June. And uh, I'm sorry, the golf classic was on is on June 17th. And uh, the Axing Out Cancer event is on July 15th. Um, there will be more about these events to follow. Trust me. Uh, I'll be putting up this information on their uh, website at the Buckeye Nest, which also links to their main site. And I'm going to put up some information about the sponsorship program they've got going on now. Uh, you'll find that on their website too. Pretty awesome group of people. I can tell you when I worked with them at the, at the VA, and obviously I haven't given up on them, uh, the work that they did out there was just unbelievable. They helped veterans with PTSD issues, and excuse me, a couple times they actually helped veterans, well, save veterans from committing suicide on the campus. So they get around and they do some good and we need to try and help them stay in business. They are a 501c3 nonprofit. They do uh, care packages and send them out to the veterans now and uh, they'll also come out to your events and, and do uh, color guard ceremonies and flag ceremonies and, and uh, bring the horses and it's just a really nice enhancement and an add-on. They do most of it for free. Why well, they do all of it for free, actually. Uh, they would hope that the events they're uh, uh, participating in would give them a donation of some kind. You'd have to contact Leah Edwards about that. She's the team captain. And you can go up on the, the website, as I said, and uh, get her contact information. Uh, that's the Four Freedom Equestrian Team. So let's move on. February. No, wait a minute. Let's do this. Got an email from a gentleman. His name is Scott Coonan. And it says, Dear friends, Happy New Year from everyone at the Wounded Warrior Amputee Softball Team. We are excited to kick off our season with spring training at Tiger Town, the home of the Detroit Tigers spring training in Lakeland, Florida, on January 26th to the 29th, 2017. Representatives from, and this is a mouthful, Wounded Warrior Amputee Softball Team, or otherwise referred to as WWAST, recently had the opportunity to tour Tiger Town and came away very impressed by the facility. This is the, the softball team that uh, uh, played a game against some senior citizens 
last year and I believe it was out at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I could be wrong, but this is like a 15-page notice here. And once again, I'm going to put this stuff up on the, the home page in the event section. And Scott is talking about the upcoming softball game that they'll do this year. So you'll need to follow up on that and get some information. Let's get into what's going on at the Dayton VA right now. That's mostly my, my main focus out there, is, and as I said earlier, the, the nonprofits. Month of February, they got four major events. Of course, let me backpedal here a second. This is the 150th anniversary of the Dayton VA. And you would not believe, I don't know if you can see how thick this little email folder is here, but these are pages all about let me get it over here. There we go. Upcoming events at the Dayton VA. So, for February, you can come out to the VA to the Fort Chaplain Ceremony on February 3rd. Now, last year, I, I recorded this event in its entirety, and it was a pretty awesome event. It's a story about four, four chaplains of different faiths in World War II. And their faith was so intense that they gave up their lives because of their faith. And it's a story of honor and, and just, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's, it had me in tears last year. And they're going to do it again this year. And that's on February 3rd. That's in the Protestant Chapel at the Dayton VA Medical Center. Then on the 16th of February, they're doing a Black History Month event. That's mostly geared not only for, for black history in general, but they talk a lot about uh, blacks in the military. And uh, I've read some of the stories uh, way back from Civil War and, and beyond that. And, of course, current uh, events with blacks in the military. You know, when a soldier enlists, when a, when a military person enlists in the military, it doesn't matter what branch, they don't see color. Of course, now there are some that do, but in most cases, most of them don't see color because they realize that when you get cut with a knife or you get shot, you're going to bleed red just like everybody else. So sometimes you've heard our military referred to as the biggest gang in the world. Well, yep, it is. Because those veterans in the military have to rely on each other to watch their backs. So there is no race in the, in the military. If there is, it's very minor. And back in my day, I had a black drill sergeant for boot camp and a black first sergeant in boot, uh, boot camp. And uh, they were so fair to, so fair with everybody, it was unbelievable. Uh, because I actually got involved in a racial issue way back in that day. And uh, they could have made my life miserable, and they didn't. And they taught me about race relations. Because I come from a very naive background down in Chillicothe, Ohio. Some of you know where that's at, some of you don't. So that's going to be a pretty good event. And, and by the way, I'm going to be out there on all these days with a camera recording that stuff. The James Reese Europe Band Concert is going to be held at the Dayton Medical Center campus on September or uh, February 17th. And then finally, they're going to have a Black History Month luncheon on February the 26th. Pretty awesome events for this month, scheduled out at the Dayton VA. I'll have that itinerary published up on the website, hopefully before the end of uh, this weekend, which is tomorrow, Sunday. So, Now, the American Veterans Heritage Center, pretty awesome group of people. whole bunch of them, I'm part of the committee. 
they do all kinds of neat things at the Dayton VA, and, and one of them, a few of them are uh, on May 20th, they're going to have an Armed Forces Day 5K run. Run, walk, or roll. Did I say that right? That's, that's a mouthful, too. On the 27th and the 28th of May, which is Memorial Day weekend, is the 13th annual Patriot Freedom Festival. Now, hold on a minute. I got a sign back here. Patriot Freedom Festival. It's free. Let's see if I can get it in there. There's the phone number to call. 937-267-7628. That's the number to give a call. And as I said, it's free. And they got all kinds of neat stuff going on at the Patriot Freedom Festival. We're hoping to line up some out-of-state entertainment, which will uh, come in to entertain you and maybe a big surprise on the, on the bandstand. This is maybes, but I've been talking to this young lady for an awful long time. There's food vendors, and there's all kinds of historical organizations there. They have uh, airplanes flying over the top, getting into dog fights, and I don't know if that's going to happen again this year, but it might. Uh, some of the events change out every year. But you need to mark your calendar. May 27th and 28th, Patriot Freedom Festival at the Dayton VA campus. Starts a, That's a Saturday and a Sunday, and it starts at 11 in the morning and, and shuts down about 6 in the evening. That's something you don't want to miss. Because I'm told maybe bugs might even show up out there. Could be, I don't know. Then on September 9th of 2017, they got a garden party planned. Now, the garden party's down in the grotto. If, if you folks haven't been out to the VA lately and gone down in that grotto, you need to because that's an awesome place. That The uh, Master Gardeners of Dayton uh, come out there a few years back and started cleaning that place up and revitalizing it and restoring it. And it's just, there's, there's no words for it either. It's just awesome. So the Dayton VA Grotto, bring yourself a picnic, especially starting this spring. Because there's picnic tables down there. If I recall right, I think I even saw a couple barbecue pits set up down there where you can cook something. Unfortunately, you can't swim in the lakes and you can't fish without permission. You need to get uh, uh, permission from the VA police before you toss a fishing pole in that water down there. But that's pretty easy, easy I understand. So set yourself up an event at the Dayton VA in the grotto. And then last but not least is Veterans Day, November 12th, 2017. It's a 5K walk, run, or roll. Last year, I recorded that event. Pretty awesome event. And I'm going to go do it again this year because I met up with three young men and their manager. And they, were, they are professional runners. They come up from Cincinnati. And what uh, surprised me about them is, is I noticed they started out in the front of the pack on that race that day. And they were the top three, the first three in. They took first, second, and third. They are professional runners. Uh, and they said they're going to come back this year. So I told them if I got a commitment from them coming back, I'll come back. So you'll be able to see me out there with my camera. Now you heard me earlier talk about the Miami Valley Military History Museum. They got so many events going on out there this year that I can't even begin to, to uh, name them all. You'll just have to check the schedule and uh, for dates and times. But uh, they got 23 events going on this year that you'll be interested in. So that's pretty much it for now. I'm quite sure I'll probably think of something else before we get started into this video here and my comments about it. But let's do that. Hope you enjoy, and you'll hear me breaking in and out, uh, in and every now and then, talking about making a point. Oh, I just remembered something else. See my buddy Franco back here? He's uh, keeping an eye over me because uh, 
he knows I get around the countryside and I do a program here at the Buckeye Nest called Thank a Veteran on Video. President Obama proclaimed that March 30th, uh, on or about, the federal government and local city, state, and county governments will hold some kind of event thanking Vietnam veterans home a proper way. That's what the Buckeye Nest does. Last year on March 30th, I recorded that event. I got approximately six hours of video up on the website about it. And I've also added all the, the welcome home videos I've run around the countryside doing. It's free. If you want to find out how you can participate in it, call me at that phone number right there. Still got to get used to backwards here. 937-926-4914. And I'll tell you more about it. All right. Without further ado, let's get into this topic of discussion. Episode 5, From a Veteran's Point of View. In moments, we will be joined by the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, Congressman Jason Chaffetz. His team fought the Obama administration for years to get some of these changes. But first, we go to Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts, live at the White House with exactly how all of this went down today. Hi, John. Martha, good evening to you. You know, all during the campaign trail, there was a running question. Would President Trump make good in his pledge to build a border wall or would the wall simply fall to the pressure of politics once he got to Washington, D.C.? Well, today, he made good on that promise, signing into in, in, signing an executive order, a sweeping series of new measures to enhance border uh, security along the southern border. First and foremost among them, construction of a new wall, which by some estimates could cost $25 billion. There was a candidate, President Trump said it would be more like 8 to $12 billion. He also wants to hire 5,000 more Border Patrol agents. The order would also eliminate the Obama-era practice of catch and release, which administration officials believe could stem the tide of migrants coming through Mexico from Central America to the United States. And here's a big one. It would also end some forms of federal funding for sanctuary cities like those of New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Initially, U.S. taxpayers would foot the bill for construction, but President Trump, as you saw there earlier, insists. Well, our topic today is uh, immigration. Sanctuary cities. I've already done uh, one uh, episode of from a veteran's point of view about sanctuary cities. You can go up on my YouTube page. That's www.youtube.com backslash Buckeye Nest LLC. And you can subscribe to my uh, YouTube page if you like. Then you'll see that video up there that I started uh up about sanctuary cities and i'm going to carry on with that thought process here and as soon as the weather clears up a little better and go out and talk about those different sanctuary cities that i found out about in the state of ohio but today <clears throat> donald well actually yesterday i'm sorry donald uh, trump our new president did some things in the white house <clears throat> that amazed a lot of people Excuse me. He signed an immigration bill. He's going to build the wall. Now, that caused such a ruckus with Mexico because he's been saying all along that uh, the government of Mexico will pay for that wall. That the president of Mexico says, no, we're not. And he canceled his meeting with President Trump. You'll see in this video where he was talking about it, but that's an update for you because today it, they put out the word that uh, he canceled the meeting with, with President Trump. So <clears throat> uh, President Trump said, well, since you decided to cancel the meeting, it wasn't going to, that means you're not going to be uh, very gracious with us and, and help us build this wall down here. So. It's probably a good idea the meeting got canceled. So I've been listening to the news and watching some internet stuff today, and and uh, President Trump said that well we're going to get that they're going to pay for that wall because we're going to put together a tariff uh, program tax program, and every product that comes into the United States is going to get a twenty percent uh, tax added to it. Well. 
Donald, if you ever see this video, if I was you and if I was president, and I could be talking out of the top of my hat, which I don't do too often because there ain't much hair down there to keep everything in the brain. I'd go 35 or 40 percent. They've uh, uh, for decades they've been uh, just letting Im illegal immigrants or just come right into country and not trying to stop them on their side to the point that uh, I think we really need to hit them a little harder. But that's my own opinion. But I'm glad you're doing that. So the immigration uh, bill that he that he uh, signed, he wants to add 5,000 additional agents. Now, I hope that uh, he puts a few of them in the, in the ICE program and they start rounding up some of these illegal aliens that are in this country and uh, deporting them back to Mexico. Uh, that's what needs to happen. A lot of you don't know it, but President Obama, in his last few hours of presidency, well, over the last four years, I'm sorry, has released over 80,000 illegal immigrants back into our society uh, without any repercussions. And, and actually, some of the guys that he uh, pardoned, he released immediately back into society too. I'm not quite sure about the total number of criminals he pardoned and turned back into society, but I do know then in the last week, uh, I did a little research and found out that he had actually pardoned 221 individuals and turned them back loose on society. And then he's talking about, sorry here, I got to take a look at my notes. Catch and release. Now, catch and release, I worked high risk security stuff in Southern California. I actually even got down around the border once or twice doing some uh, investigation work, uh, trying to uh, help out some families that uh, had lost relatives in, in somewhere in, in California. So catch and release is pretty simple. It's what it is. Our Border Patrol agents was told, if you catch somebody trying to come into the country illegally, just take them back over there and release them. Pretty sad, huh? Especially when one of them got caught and deported six times, and then his seventh trip into the country, he murdered uh, that young lady, Mrs. Steinley. Just walked up and blew her brains out. Her and her dad was walking along a riverbank or some kind of a lake or something there. And the last thing her dad heard was, Help me, Daddy. Help me. All my life I've worked protecting people's lives and properties. I can't begin to tell you how bad that tears me up. That's That's been one of my worst nightmares in my professional career. And I've seen a lot of ugly. Worked South Central Los Angeles, as I said, for many, many years. So I've seen a lot of ugly. A lot of it committed by illegal aliens. Did you know that if you lived in Southern California and a gangbanger drove up to you and said to you, and I quote, quotes, where are you from? If you didn't give them the right answer, they just blew your brains out right there on the corner. They were expecting to hear your allegiance to, as to whether you were a blood or a crip or even lower level, the actual neighborhood gang you belong to. But once again, that's the gang mentality. And what makes up gang mentalities in Southern California? Mostly illegal aliens. Some of them were brought over here by their families. Some of them were born here. But the, the point I'm getting to is, is they live in that mentality. And the law is black and white. And I heard it mentioned just the other day, the best way is, is 
when an immigrant comes to this country, they need to come in through the front door. They need to do it right. They need to get their papers. They need to uh, take the oath. They need to learn the history. And our immigration is so out of whack and so far off in left field. I actually watched a video of a guy the other day that claims that says he is an illegal alien and he is part of a, of a statewide organization in California trying to stop all this stuff. And maybe I'll do a little episode six on that video because that that just really blew me out of the water. So what I what I the point I'm making here is it's pretty simple. President Trump, you need to get somebody up in the White House because there are some really stupid individuals out there on the internet that's going to jump up there and tell the whole wide world I'm an illegal alien and proud of it and la da da ha di da da. Well, you need to send some of those 5,000 new uh, agents you're hiring. Pound on those people's doors. Check out Facebook. Take them into custody. Vet them. Find out who they are, what they are, and if they don't have proper paperwork, give them a prison sentence of, say, maybe a year or two for illegally crossing the border, and then ship them back over and tell them if you come back again, it's going to be worse. It's going to be 5 to 10. It's going to be 20. Maybe you need to build a couple prisons down there in Texas and uh, Arizona and those neighborhoods to do nothing but house illegal aliens that get caught coming into this country. Just food for thought. Then the last thing on that bill that he talks about is the sanctuary cities. And as I said earlier in this video, you've already heard me talk about those. But he's going to cut funding to the sanctuary cities. And it's my understanding there's about 300 of them across the nation. Eight of them right here in Ohio. And he's going to cut funding to those uh, sanctuary cities because they are allowing illegal immigrants to live in their cities without repercussions, so to speak. The state of California issued... 8,800,000 driver's licenses to illegal aliens. How can you get a driver's license if you are not a legal citizen in this, in this country? That other video I was mentioning about that gentleman that declared he was an illegal alien, he had a social security card. And he was asked repeatedly how he got his social security card if he is not a legal alien. And the moderator on the, the video reminded him that he his father bought bought his social security card i don't know how much they paid for it and i don't really know if if it's all i mean i know it's not legal but the point is is, is i don't know whose name they're using on it and if they were paying social security whose social security account it went into maybe a dead person already in which case his claim that, claim that the illegal aliens have paid in billions and billions of dollars to the federal government might be true, but at that point in the game, it's on. It, it's just locked up because that's a dead person that that, that money is in an account for. So then the feds have to run around trying to figure out what's going on with this. That's just part of, of uh, some of the issues that uh, illegal aliens cause. Let's get back into the video. And Mexico ultimately will pay that bill. Another big executive order coming, this one likely on Friday, the policy that was originally called the Muslim ban. President Trump will temporarily, temporarily suspend visas from nations like Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Libya, Somalia, and Yemen. He's also expected to reduce the number of refugees that are allowed to come into the United States and potentially put a temporary ban on all refugees from Syria coming into the U.S. until those extreme vetting measures can be put in place. Martha, the president, firmly believes that that, combined with the enhanced security measures on the southern border, really will go a long way to improving security, national security, here in the United States. Martha? Yeah, thank you very much.
much. Joining me now, Congressman Jason Chaffetz, Chairman of the House Oversight Committee, which held several hearings on the Obama administration's practice of capturing and releasing criminal illegal immigrants. He joins us now from the Republican retreat that is going on in Philadelphia, but he put on a tie for us this evening. Uh, everybody was in sweaters today. Hey, Jason, good to see you, Congressman. Welcome. So I did. I just clipped on this tie. Uh, I appreciate with you. that. Very nice of you. So, you, you know, you just listened to John Roberts' report. I mean, you've got potential action on yeah. DACA, on Muslim immigrants to this country. You have, you know, shockwaves yeah. going across the country mm -hmm. at the fact that he's actually following through with a lot of what he said he would do. Build the wall and the like. Your thoughts on all this? Well, it is shocking, right, for those on the left, those liberals who didn't think that you'd actually elect somebody who did what they said they were going to do and actually enforce the law. All we tried to do for over the last eight years is try to get President Obama to enforce the law, and he would not do it. And so to have President Trump take this action in the first few days, I think, sends a strong signal. I wholeheartedly support it, and uh, we desperately need it. All right. Who's going to pay for the wall? Uh, the upfront money is going to come from the U.S. taxpayer. How's that going to work? Well, I think uh, we're going to visit with, uh, with President Trump, but I do think Mexico will ultimately pay for it. And it's going to help both countries. And I heard you mention that potentially the president of Mexico is not going to come to the United States. That would be the absolute uh, uh, wrong move. We have strong cultural ties. We have a lot of trade that happens between the two countries. But I do believe in securing the border, we're going to help end human trafficking. We're going to help deal with the weapons problems of crossing the border. We're going to deal with the illegal drug trade and deal with the legal things that we should have. And, and that's in the interest of both the United States and Mexico. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest concerns on the part of people who are here or children who were born here, mm -hmm. we heard so much about DACA and deferring action yeah. in terms of kicking them out. I, I want to go to this soundbite between uh, now President Trump, but he was on the campaign trail at the time, and Chuck Todd talking about what's known as DACA. Watch. The executive order gets uh, rescinded. One good thing you'll about rescind, you'll rescind that one too. One good thing you'll about rescind the Dream Act executive you're order. Have to, DACA. We have to make a whole new set of standards, and when people come in, they have so to come in. You're going to split up families. Split up families. Paul Ryan was asked about this tonight in an interview, and he said the Dreamers need not worry. What's your understanding of whether or not they need to worry? Well, look, we need to fix legal immigration, but I want to prioritize going after those criminal aliens. Under Barack Obama, he released more than 80,000 people that were here in this country illegally, committed a crime, were convicted of that crime, and rather than deporting them, he released them back out into the public. So there's this criminal element out there that should be prioritized, not some three-year-old who didn't come here um, you know, by their own volition. But at the same time, we have laws on the books. <coughs> and I think what we see in the signal out of the White House today, which is so encouraging, let's enforce the law and fix legal immigration. I think that's a good mantra. So the other thing that is coming next is, is the rule on countries that harbor terrorists or where terrorism comes yeah. from. Uh, Syria would be on that list. Yemen would be on that list. Libya and the like. Uh, what do you think? And can he do it? I think extreme vetting, making sure we know exactly who these people are, what their background is. Remember, we heard the FBI director a, a long time ago say, we can't properly vet these people because we don't know their background. And the other thing I heard President Trump talk about was dealing with asylum reform. This is a bill that I've been championing. It has absolutely, it's being taken advantage of. People are coming here claiming asylum. They'll get a court date in 2020. Now they're here legally, and yet they snuck into the country. And so. There's a lot of fix there. An entry exit program, I, I just uh, very proud of what the president did today. It's the Before right Before I let action. you go, I, I want to ask you something on a different topic. Um, a report that came out today that you're looking yeah. into the Trump D.C. hotel lease. What is that about? Well, we did ask at the beginning of December to see what this uh, contract looks like, and that's all. We've simply requested that. We'll see where it goes. Um, but uh, the, the Oversight Committee did request the, that copy Are of that lease. Are you concerned lease. that there's not a strong enough separation between the business and, and the president where that hotel is concerned, or what? No, I, I think there's an interesting question when you have somebody who is both the uh, tenant and the landlord. Uh, how is that going to work? And we're curious as to what uh, uh, the GSA who administers these contracts, uh, what do they think of that, and how is that going to work out? All right. Well, stay tuned. Congressman Chaffetz, thank you very much. Good to see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So there was also news breaking in the last hour on a report that suggests the Trump administration wants to bring back waterboarding. Dr. James Mitchell is the man who interrogated the mastermind KSM behind. You know, this this next topic of. Uh, 
waterboarding as a form of torture. It's performed on prisoners of, prisoners of war or uh, military personnel that get captured by the enemy and then they're listed as missing in action until the enemy actually declares that they've got you in custody to the federal government of the United States. So waterboarding technique and other forms of interrogation that's what they're going to get in, in, into talking about now. When I was in the Army, we were trained how to deal with becoming a prisoner of war. Of course, the first thing they told us was do your utmost best to not get captured. Being a tanker, I was inside of a tank, either driving it or loading the main gun or shooting the main, you know, as the gunner, firing the, the weapon or working in, in the uh, command, tank commander's cupola, commanding the tank. But the point I'm making here is, is that it's a stationary object. It's, it's a fixed object. So as tankers, we knew one of two things was going to happen. We were going to get captured. And at that point, we had to decide if we wanted to stay alive and go with the enemy. Or if we were going to resist to the point where they just shot us. Or we were going to die inside that tank. Because the enemy... Uh, tanks were high priority. They knew that we could uh, come into a battle zone with our tanks back in the day were M60A1s and we just literally kicked ass and took names. We rolled through the battle zone and we killed things. That was our job. So their job was to find us and get and either annihilate us, get rid of us as quick as they could or capture us. So when we got captured, we were told first thing that is, is once we got captured, we were to never just give in. We were to resist everything, which brought a whole bunch of pain on us, on, on the individual that was captured, the prisoner of war. And when they were questioned, the only thing they were allowed to give was name, rank, and serial number. Name, Dewey Maynard. Rank, Private E3. And then my serial number. That's all we were allowed to give. That's what they, they told us. That's the only thing we should give the enemy. That's the only thing that the, the Geneva Convention uh, is covering us with with once be, once become prisoners of war name rank and serial number we were told we were going to get tortured and the vietnamese they had some pretty good uh, ways of doing it they would pull your fingernails off your finger, your hands they would take punji stakes uh, bamboo stakes and sharpen them up cover them with uh, human feces poke a guy with him when he was when he was uh, incarcerated in their their prisons of course then what happens is is that POW that prisoner of war he gets infection then they'll sometimes they'll haul him down to the hospital and clear up the infection sometimes they won't they'll let the guy lay there in the cell with the rest of them uh, moaning in, in pain and, and of course that does a lot of psychological things to a prisoner of war so the point I'm making is, is this, and you're going to hear about it here in the video with this gentleman. Freedom's not free. Veteran gets taken prisoner of war. He pays for that, for that, that war 
a thousand times more than than a, a regular combat soldier or or a support soldier does. And as you you've heard me speak in some other videos, being a, a missing in action individual, that's even worse yet because the psychological toll on your family back home not knowing if you're alive or not uh, plays on you too as a veteran so the quickest way to end wars is to interrogate enemy prisoners gather information and act on that information that's the only way we're going to get rid of ISIS those guys that they got down in Guantanamo they quit what they call enhanced interrogation techniques because a whole bunch of people jumped up and said well that's not right that's not humane war is not humane people die in wars people take an oath to protect you your property this country and live by God Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. So let's get back to the video. 9-11. He will join us with his thoughts on what is being called a draft report tonight. Plus, President Trump signing order after order, and the headlines are taking note of the, quote, incredible pace coming out of the White House. Brit Hume joins us with a look at what he thinks of all of this. And then the new president is tonight sending a strong message to sanctuary cities. He is ordering them to comply with the laws that are already on the books or else. Coming up next, we'll speak with a mom who went through a horrific experience as her son was murdered, who is a self-proclaimed undocumented immigrant. He's an activist and the founder of Hashtag Emerging US. I know this has been an emotional day for both of you, and I really want to... Well, you heard me all talking earlier about another video that I watched and I was talking about this guy that was uh, openly admitting that he was an Ill illegal alien and you got to forgive me sometimes my brain just walks out on me it's uh, part of getting old I guess but uh, this next piece you're gonna see is this that that video I was talking about First guy you're going to see talking is his name is Jose. Jose. He apologizes to the to the lady that uh, her son was killed by an illegal alien gangbanger in high school. But then he goes off in right field and starts uh, defending the right of the illegal alien in this country, including himself. Well, this is that comment I made uh, in the, uh, earlier in this video about uh, President Trump needs to set up a bunch of people just watching social media because there are stupid people out there. Trust me, they are. And they'll get up there on the internet and then, uh, they record videos of beating people up and, and uh, uh, in this case, this guy here openly defying the federal government and telling them that he is an illegal alien. Well, President Trump, I think you need to go pick this guy up and make a make an example of him and haul his uh, butt off to prison and get him vetted and then ship him back uh, to beyond the border. Because uh, all he's doing here in this video is this rubbing it in southern california guy rubbing it into the citizens of this country he's admitting he come in the back door and has been here for years and has a right to stay here watch the video i'm going to break into this several times because this really aggravates me I want to thank you both uh, for being here today. Laura, first of all, let me start with you. When you were standing there and you watched these documents get signed, what went through your mind? Relief. Uh, we're finally going to um, have someone in there that wants to 
uh, follow current law and uphold the law. And so it was absolutely a relief today and a, um, a start, a start. Jose, I know that you've said today was very tough for you. Tell me, tell me why. Um, and when you look at the fact that, that what he's talking about doing is enforcing laws that are already part of the federal legal canon of this of the country. Well, first of all, um, thank you for having me. I actually met Ms. Wilkerson um, at the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, and I met her and apologized to her about this whole horrific ordeal um, that no mother should ever go through. Um, I have to say, however, you know, the facts tell us that the vast majority of undocumented people in this country are not criminals. To be in this country illegally is a civil offense, not a criminal one. The vast majority of us are not murderers and rapists and killers. Um, that, that man... Never ceases to amaze me, this young man immediately starts defending Ill illegal aliens. And he immediately goes on to the topic of talking about how these immigration laws are going to affect all illegal aliens. And he immediately starts defending all illegal aliens. But the point is, and it's not civil, it is criminal. Okay? You cross the border illegally. That is a criminal offense in this country. You need to be put in prison, and after that, you need to be vetted and sent back to your country, and you come through the front door. Laura Wilkerson, Wilkerson there, she lost a son to an illegal alien. I recall an event in my professional career. I was working as a store detective for an organization called Safeway in Southern California. They're a grocery chain. I was up working a two-way mirror, and this was back in early 80s, I believe, or late 70s. And I spotted this guy. I forget exactly what it was he stole. I think it was some meat out of the, the meat uh, department. But I come down out of the, my uh, catwalk and come down on the floor, and I watched him on the floor. And then when he got ready to leave the property, he walked past all the cash registers, and he didn't pay for that. He didn't declare that he had it. I'm I'm hot on his heels. Now I'm six foot six, folks. At that time, I was weighing probably around 285, 300 pounds. I didn't take no for an answer. When I reached out and snatched a hold of you, you knew you got snatched a hold of. I didn't play no games with you. So I step out. I'm a half a step behind this guy. And as we're stepping out the front door, I'm getting ready to ID myself and take him into custody. And two L.A. County Sheriff's deputies stepped up, one on each side of him, and shoved double barrel sh or shoved shotguns up underneath of his ears so hard and so tight it literally lifted his head up off his body. And probably maybe even picked him up a half an inch or so off the ground. And they took him down for murder. They had a warrant for his arrest for murder. And he was an illegal alien. And here I am going to go out here and snatch a hold of this man for shoplifting. Probably wanted that, that, that food that he stole to eat because he was on the run. But point. The illegal alien. And had those deputies not taken him into custody outside that front door, I probably would have had to fought with him in the parking lot to get the property back and take him into custody. I think that day I was working by myself. My standard partner was sick. But back to the video. And it ended up, you know, the horrible, that horrible, horrible tragedy was committed by an outlier, not not a somebody who is part of the norm. I don't think anyone is suggesting, Jose, that, that, that everybody who is here who's undocumented is a murderer. That's not what it's about. What it's about is enforcing the laws that are on the books. And what we've heard tonight from Paul Ryan, and we're going to hear more about, you know, returning people, because I think that's, I would assume that's your biggest concern, right, is the children like well, yourself also, who are brought here with their families. But, but the, the thing, though, is the, 
the implication of the language that we've been using and how we talk about people, right? I have to say, by the way, let's talk about enforcing the laws. Um, when are we going to talk about the American employers who actually benefit and exploit undocumented workers? Well, Jose here's talking about the employers. Once again, he's twisting the, the uh, conversation around to put the fear in the public. Now he wants to put the fear in em employers. And of course, in his earlier comments, he was trying to put the fear in you. Trying to make you believe that certain things was going to happen to you that's not going to happen to you. It's going to happen to illegal aliens. So he's talking about employers now. I'm going to tell you another story. True story. Southern California. Torrance, Ohio. Torrance, California. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to mention the name of the company. Because I'm going to let the feds take care of them. And they'll probably figure out who I'm talking about. This company hired a lot of illegal aliens a lot i worked security there our standard order was when we saw immigration coming and we had to deal with them several times in the respect that trying to slow them down so the illegals that we had in the plant could dissipate get out the back doors and over the fences or whatever so they wouldn't get rounded up and hauled back to Mexico. When we saw immigration coming, and you could always tell they were coming because in these particular cases, they had these black vans. Uh, they were all the same make, model, color, and it was a convoy of them, and you could see them coming from a distance. You secured all your external gates except for the one, and then if uh, they tried to come through the back gates or anything like that, the security officers were told to send them around to the main gate. And of course, that's where I worked. And then I would uh, tell them to sit right there on the side of the road till I got permission from plant manager to allow them on the property. But in all this time, all these Ill illegal aliens are running out of the place like ants. <laughs> it was kind of funny to watch them and, because uh, it was kind of like stepping on an ant hill and then all the ants dissipating and going different ways and uh, climbing over the fences and they would hide on top of the overhead doors. And one of the, the uh, funny things, we, we walked through the plant with these agents and of course you could hear them. We had the big overhead doors on the docks and a couple of them were really stupid and they got up on top of those doors as they were open. So the federal agent was hollering at them in Mexican, in Spanish, and of course they weren't complying, so he just walked over and pushed the button on the door and the door started coming down. Yep, you guessed it. Those guys come off of that door real fast or they was going to fall off of that door and probably end up in a hospital. But he took them into custody. But the point I'm making is, is this, is this, that particular incident, I remember uh, what occurred that day, and I'm just guessing there was a whole lot of more big manufacturers in Southern California of different products that hired and worked illegal aliens. Probably didn't pay them much, maybe minimum wage or less. Put them on the docks, worked them to death, worked them 10, 12 hours a day. They didn't seem to care, though. I know a lot of them sent their money home. So the, the money you're going to talk about, uh, you're going to hear Jose talking about here. Yeah, they may have uh, uh, paid billions of dollars into it, but they also sent billions of dollars home to their families down in Mexico. So let's get back to the video. Workers in this country. I'm in California, right? Home to two million undocumented people. Are we going to talk about the U.S. employers, the American employers, and how they benefit from us? How about Texas? 1.8 million undocumented people in the state of Texas. The construction industry would not survive in Texas well, without undocumented workers. I mean, I think there workers. are two sides are to the story. Are we going to enforce but, those but, laws? But, but let me ask you, you know, I, and Laura, let me ha ask you to weigh in on this because you know, you know, you hear what Jose is saying in terms of the people who are here. You know, it, it, I. 
I assume that you want simply the laws to be followed, and that might lead to you know fewer workers being here, correct? And then everyone has to deal with that. That's exactly right. And you know, you, you say you've had a tough day. You know, I don't know if you understand what a tough day is in the life of a parent who's lost a child at the hands of an illegal in this country. No one's here to say the vast majority, but you're legal or illegal. It's one way or the other. There's no gray area on that. You've had plenty of time in this country to get in line, come in the front door. Your parents brought you here undocumented, and that's something that's a question you'll have to have for your parents. But you have had plenty of time to get in line, and we don't have to make any excuses for for that we have to do nothing for the illegal here they need to come in and come through the front door there's a process it needs to be ongoing and enforced well put uh, i mean Jose, I, I, you know i, I mean that they, these are laws that are on the books i'll say it again you know what's wrong with a country having a border with controlling who comes in and who goes out why is that a radical idea it's not a radical idea of course the country has a right to define and defend its border i totally get that but why are people here are we here so people can enjoy calling us criminals and being dehumanized and being taught that all we're doing is actually be a burden in this country when the reality is we contribute billions of dollars to the economy of this country? But let me address you numbers, do uh, what, what Laura just said. Oh, you know, you, you actually should talk to the IRS and the Social Security Administration. We have paid billions of dollars into Social Security and to the federal government. How do it's you have a Social ICIN Security number, card ITIN. to be in this country? How do you have a Social Security You should security ask number. the Social Security Administration. So, well, but this is, I'm asking so you, how do you get that, that you as an undocumented person? I believe person. your grandfather bought it, is that right? My grandfather bought it, but, yeah. but let me just say this but, uh, about the comment that you made. I live in the gray area. This is not black and there white. Is no this is not area. about just illegal... Ver oh, there's... Ab I, we, millions of people live the gray area every day. Man. You are in this country illegally, you know and there, that's it. That's it there. Right I thank both of you for being here. Um, the, the details of all of this will come out in the days and weeks to come. Um, it's clear from what we've heard so far that, that it is criminal. People who have committed crimes, who are here illegally, who would be first on the list uh, for this kind of pushback. So, Laura Wilkerson, thank you very much. Jose Vargas, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Obviously, a continuation of that conversation is to come. And coming up here tonight... Some new calls for an investigation into voter fraud coming from the president himself. One of the people who could play a key role in all of this joins us. Plus, breaking news tonight on reports that President Trump plans a very controversial approach to dealing with terrorists. Is that true? We will break it down for you next. When ISIS is doing things that nobody has ever heard of since medieval times, would I feel strongly about waterboarding? As far as I'm concerned, we have to fight fire with fire. Breaking tonight, could President Trump be bringing back enhanced interrogation? The New York Times ran this headline this morning, quote, Trump poised to lift ban on CIA black site prisons with a three-page executive order draft possibly clearing the way for waterboarding and other enhanced interrogation techniques to be used once again on terror suspects. Now, this draft order has reignited a debate over whether or not these methods are effective and whether or not they are legal or should be reinstated ever. Dr. James Mitchell, who has interrogated some of the world's most notorious terrorists, including KSM, We'll talk to us about this in a moment. But first, let's go to national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin, who is live in our nation's capital with some confusion uh, that surrounded this document today. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Martha. Well, White House sources tell us there is no plan to resurrect CIA black sites, nor is there a plan to review the procedures in the Army Field Manual. President Trump, however, said in an interview today that he still favors waterboarding, but will leave the decision to his CIA Director Mike Pompeo and Defense Secretary James Mattis, who both said they oppose torture. As far as I'm concerned, we have to fight fire with fire. I will rely <coughs> on Pompeo and Mattis and my group. And if they don't want to do, that's fine. If they do want to do, then I will work toward that end. I want to do everything within the bounds of what you're allowed to do legally. But do I feel it works? Absolutely, I feel it works. The New York Times published a draft document from the transition, one of thousands that were written by various individuals, suggesting possible policies that the Trump administration might want to pursue in executive orders. It is not a White House document. I have no idea where it came from, uh, but it is not a White House document. Pompeo was asked about reinstituting reinstitu waterboarding and torture during his confirmation hearing. 
if you were ordered by the president to restart the CIA's use of enhanced interrogation techniques that fall outside of the Army Field Manual, would you comply? Senator, absolutely not. More, moreover, I can't imagine that I would be asked that by the president-elect or then-president. But in written testimony a few days later, Pompeo seemed to leave the door open to waterboarding and the use of torture. Quote, if experts believed current law was an impediment to gathering vital intelligence to protect the country, I would want to understand such impediments and whether any recommendations were appropriate for changing current law. The reaction from the Hill was swift with Senator John McCain saying the law is the law and that America is not bringing back torture. Back to you, Martha. Jennifer, thank you very much. So joining us now, Dr. James Mitchell, author of Enhanced Interrogation, Inside the Minds and Motives of the Islamic Terrorists Trying to Destroy America. Dr. Mitchell has interrogated some of the world's worst terrorists, including 9-11 mastermind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, doctor, very good to have you with us tonight. Thank you for well, being thanks here. Thanks for having me. You know, well, just thank in you terms for having of, me on. Of the, thank you. In terms of the news that broke today, when you read this story and you heard about this document that had been circulated, which, which talked about bringing these things back. Do you know what the number one killer of testosterone for men over 40 is? This this document that had been circulated, which, which talked about bringing these things back. What went through your mind? Where do you think this came from? I have no idea where it came from, but in my mind, it would make perfect sense for the new president to try to get a handle on whether things were working or they weren't working. I don't know whether that documents are fake. I have no inside knowledge about that. But it does make sense to take a look at whether or not the current measures that we have or uh, what we need to have to protect ourselves. So after 9-11, you were asked to come up with interrogation techniques because you had taught our military how to avoid that kind of, of grueling questioning and not break down. So you did the yes. reverse and, and reverse engineered it, essentially. Tell everybody at home what you did to KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind behind 9-11, and how you broke him. Well, we wouldn't use the word broke. I mean, we... we uh, we did waterboard him. He was actually very good about avoiding the waterboard. The thing that actually got him uh, cooperating enough that we could use social influence, which is really what's important to use more so than the EITs, his, uh, social influence techniques, was walling and sleep deprivation. But once he and he was only in, he was only subjected to enhanced interrogation for 21 days. He would. That's three weeks. He was in CIA custody before he was moved to Guantanamo for another 170 weeks where he cooperated. So this emphasis on EITs and this emphasis on how long they were subjected to it, I think, is overplayed. So you, do you think we should bring back black sites, that we should bring back the ability to use these techniques? Because it sounds like what you're saying is that it wasn't ultimately the waterboarding that worked on him. Um, it, was, it was the combination of all of these things. Is that right? It, well, yeah, we believe that it was the combination of, uh, of all of those things in that short period of time that he was exposed to them. Somewhere between waterboarding and worst and the Army Field Manual, there should be some legal form of coercion. Because I would encourage all of your viewers to actually read Senator McCain's press release today. What he says in that press release is that we're restricted to the Army Field Manual, and the whole purpose of the Army Field Manual is to rely on what the detainees voluntarily tell us and what i discovered after i had spent so much time years literally with some of the worst people on the planet is some of them do volunteer to tell you things and when they do that's great yeah. but some of them like ksm would not have told us what we needed to know to dis to disrupt that second wave of attacks and we should not have our national defense protecting us from terrorists based on what some terrorist is willing to tell us voluntarily so you would advise President Trump to revisit these concepts? I would advise him to, to take a look at them. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be the postal boy for waterboarding because I, I'm the guy who tried to get the CIA to stop waterboarding after we did it on three people once the Hambali second wave of attacks was disrupted. We told them we didn't think they needed to do that anymore. But we do have to, I think we do have to look at the techniques and determine what is working. And I'm telling you, there's a handful of people out there Well, that's about going to do it for 
today's episode of from a veteran's point of view episode number five got a couple more minor comments I want to make and then we're gonna sign off here and I'm gonna compile this video and I'm gonna ship it up to uh, DATV and burn a copy of it and mail it off to KIT TV burn some more copies off of it and you know, give it around to some of the organizations I work with first off I got a really neat thing that happened recently I'm a Vietnam veteran I didn't put boots on the ground but I am a Vietnam veteran and you heard me tell you earlier I was a tanks I joined the Vietnam Veterans of America Association uh, organization over here it's a national organization and I'm with chapter 97 the Miami Valley uh, chapter over in Huber Heights uh, we meet the uh, third Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. and if you're a Vietnam veteran you need to come over and check us out we're at 5657 Roseberry Drive in Inglewood or I'm sorry in Huber Heights but if you use your GPS it's gonna show up as a Dayton address and follow that address that is a correct address to the location uh, it's just baffling how they could put Dayton on there and not Huber Heights but once again it's 5657 uh, Roseberry Drive Dayton Ohio but that'll take you to the chapter meeting location over in Huber Heights uh, on your GPS so you're gonna hear from me again next week from a veterans point of view I want to thank the American Veterans Heritage Center they're a nonprofit organization so if you get a chance folks and you got a spare dollar or two or a hundred or a million send it to them they do a lot of great work out at the American Veterans uh, at the Dayton VA Medical Center Plaza campus I'm sorry that's that brain working again and of course I help out the four freedom equestrian team and if you got a buck or two help them out and then let's not forget the uh, Dayton National Cemetery Honor Squad those guys are pretty awesome guys they still need volunteers all these organizations I just mentioned need volunteers uh, to help them keep the programs going uh, Patriot Freedom Festival seriously needs a lot of help in May and you would contact the American Veterans Heritage Center for that and of course you can find contact information up on the Buckeye Nest and that's www.buckeyenest.com until next time may God bless you and yours and this great country that we live in and uh, I hope Donald Trump fulfills all the campaign promises he made and it looks like he is which is, in my opinion is going to make us a better nation to live in goodbye <laughs>